Hey Calvary, uh, Pastor Joshua here to teach the Tuesday night Bible study. Um, as you can tell, I'm not Nate Holdridge. He's about I don't know, this much taller than me. Uh, but hey, it's great to be here and to just kind of give you guys the message for tonight. Uh, we're not going to be continuing through Genesis. We're actually going to be picking up in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's one of my favorite Old Testament books. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to, to read it through your Christian faith and have some time to study it. But we're going to be going into chapter 8, uh, verses 14 down to the end of chapter 8 there. Um, just kind of studying a couple verses today, but I hope and I pray that, that it will encourage you and grow you and just like urge you into a place of joy uh, amidst of this season of life. And so while you're turning there, again, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, I'm going to pray and we'll just get into the study, okay? Father, we just thank you so much for your love and your grace on this Tuesday night. I just thank you that we can praise you and can worship you, whether uh, here at church, God, like we've had the privilege to, or whether we're home watching this video on our laptops or TVs. God, I just thank you that we have the privilege of praising and worshiping you as your disciples, as your Christians, as your church. Uh, Lord, I ask and I pray that the word would just speak to the hearts and minds of the listeners and those that are just eager to study your word. Father, that your Holy Spirit would work and move. And, and Spirit, I just pray and ask that you would work through me, that you would put me aside and you would look past my inadequacies, my failures as a man, and that your word would speak just truth and love and grace to whoever's listening and studying through this. So I just thank you and praise you for this time. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of teaching your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Calvary, like I said, uh, I'm Pastor Joshua. If you don't know me, I run the middle school and high school ministry here. Um, it's, it's such a privilege and such a blessing. I've been here about three years now. Um, but really, I've been doing youth ministry for close to 15 years uh, with my wife, and uh, I, I just absolutely love it. I think I'm one of those lifers who is always going to be doing youth ministry or involved in it in some way. Um, but so if I use some verbiage or some modern day uh, linguistics that usually your kids use or, you know, Generation Z, forgive me for that. It's just because I'm used to talking and hanging out and teaching to uh, those middle school and high school kind of age group. And so I'll try not to use dude or, um, you know, anything like that. I don't even think they use dude anymore. I think I just dated myself. Anyway. All right, guys, hopefully you're there. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Um, so to start this study, I actually want to look at the New Testament for a minute. Um, Jesus actually summed up uh, like the greatest commandment in this simple way in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 38. When he, when he was asked, uh, you know, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus answered him by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So Jesus gives back this answer that basically sums up the whole Old Testament, sums up all the law, all the prophet, the Ten Commandments by loving your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And this is the greatest and first commandment. Now, in this commandment, Jesus gives us the foundation of how to live life to the fullest within the boundaries of honoring God um, as we should all do as Christians. So he kind of gives us this foundation. Now, this is a thread that we can really be found all through humanity and in essence is the one and great attribute that defines a man and a woman, a man or a woman who decides to live a life for Christ. It's kind of this foundation, this thread that defines us of, of, of a people that honors God. Now I want to take that verse in Matthew chapter 22 and now go back to the Old Testament and start looking at the book of Ecclesiastes and specifically what this man, you know, some, some theologians believe it's Solomon, um, but he calls himself the preacher and the way that he describes life. Uh, I want to take us through the book of Ecclesiastes a little bit. The preacher of Ecclesiastes takes us through, the reader, uh, many outlooks and insights of how to live uh, a life, um, how to live a life to the fullest, kind of like his worldview, how he, could, how he saw things take place. Uh, he also very plainly and really no hold bar tells us when something is of vanity and he tells us when something is of worth and he kind of lays this all out for us. Uh, the preacher or Solomon right, is a master at showing us the two sides of every choice uh, that we can make in life and even lays out the consequences 
of those choices for us. Many times through Ecclesiastes we see this. He lays out how men and women or humanity makes choices, but then there's consequences to those choices. Most of the time we see a very black and white outcome for the preacher. Uh, either you are living in the consequences of a constant vanity, or you are still living in vanity, but you're honoring God within that vanity. Some would say that Solomon himself, or the preacher here in the book of Ecclesiastes, is quite the pessimist. Uh, now, I, I would take him more as a realist, as he just kind of looks at life, but you know, you can take it as it is. Either way, he says most of life is vanity, and really the only thing not vanity is honoring God with your life. Ultimately, one side of that coin is living for self, self-ambition, self-game, uh, self-pleasures, uh, or your personal kingdom, uh, and not acknowledging God for the many, many blessings that he gives us each and every day. Where the other side of that coin is in a selfless ambition, selfless gain, uh, seeking others while being over your own self, and attempting to honor God in all that you do. Uh, in the preacher's worldview or his viewpoint, there are ultimately only a few outcomes to a man or woman who gets to live on this earth for the short time they get to be here. And consequently, in that viewpoint, there are inevitable con uh, outcomes that you and I cannot escape from. So basically what the preacher does is he lays out there are people of good and there are people of evil. There is righteousness. There is wickedness. Um, you can live this life in vanity. You can live this life uh, in less vanity honoring God. But there are actually some circumstances that you and I cannot escape from, right? Cannot escape from. Uh, some of the points he makes, and there's many of them, but here are some of the ones that I brought out. First one that you see in the book of Ecclesiastes is we all die. So yeah, we all die. If that was... Uh, if that's a shock to you, then, you know, I don't know where you're living or how reality works for you, but we all die. You can't escape it. You can't run from it. You cannot buy your way out of it. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. You are given an allotted time on this earth, and nothing's going to change that. Uh, another point that Solomon makes, the preacher, and in, in kind of a point of life that we can't escape is uh, you have no say in how everything you built or gained in this earth um, really happens. What happens to that after you die? Uh, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much time, how much energy, how much um, wealth you put into building your empire or building your kingdom. When you pass on, your successor can do whatever they want to that kingdom and that empire. They could tear it all down. They could tear down everything you built because when you pass on, you have no say what happens here on earth. Another point he makes is we have a beautiful gift of free will from God, and he allows us to use it as ever we want or ever we see fit, as long as we can accept the consequences of those choices. Basically, the preacher lays out multiple times over and over again, you and I as humans have this beautiful gift that we can really choose whatever life we want, but there are consequences to those choices. Another one is we're ultimately not in control, but an all-powerful creator is. Uh, I love how the preacher kind of in that pessimistic and realist point of view will kind of give us a scene and draw out this picture um, and show the vanity in many things that humans do, but actually then brings it back around to, but there is a God, there's a creator, this all-powerful deity that, that is really in control of all of it. And last point is the greatest thing you can do in this life is to find joy in honoring God with the life, time, abilities, and gifts he has given you. It's kind of like taking all that makes you, you, all your passions, your desires, the, your gifts, the things that you're good at, and giving those back to God. That's basically what he says over and over again is the greatest thing that you can do in this life is giving back those things to God and saying, okay, God, use them for your glory and your will. Ultimately, with all the many topics the preacher covers through Ecclesiastes, I want to narrow in on one specific one, which is joy. Right? I want to narrow in on this subject of joy and really the text that we have today, the, in a sense, the center of it, right? It's, it's about joy. Not just any joy, but the one and only true joy of a man or woman who lives their life knowing that serving King Jesus is better than anything else they could do in this life. That's a specific joy. That's not just any joy. That's not just any type of happiness or emotion. That's a very specific joy that only only the church, only the body of Christ, only those who are dedicated to serving King Jesus that in, in, within their life and everything that they are, they have a very specific joy that you're not going to find anywhere else because there's nothing better than that. A joy that is only found 
in a life when a person takes what they have, enjoys it to the full, and then hands it back to the Creator with such thankfulness and peace for the time that they got to enjoy it. It's in a sense, if we live in that kingdom mindset, if we live in that mindset where Jesus is king, then everything I have is his. Even my own children, in a sense, I'm, I get to be their dad for the rest of their life, sure. And, and their kids for a very small percentage of their life, or most of the percentage of their life, they're adults. But see, their testimony, the, the, the plans and the purpose for their life, what they were made to do, is not in my playbook. <laughs> I don't get a say necessarily. I get to be a part of that, I get to pour into them, I get to, to try to lead them to God and keep them on that narrow path in wisdom and knowledge as a godly man. But the fact is, their testimony does not belong to me. Their testimony belongs to Jesus. And I, and I try to take that analogy with everything that's in my life and give it back to him to find that true joy and peace as, I, as he really, in a sense, emphasizes those passions and desires because I've given them back to him. In our Christian theology, we believe that we only have one life to live here on earth. We do. There's no reincarnation. There's no second chances here. <laughs> you get one go around in this life. Now, one life to accomplish and to pursue whatever task and passions you desire. God gives you that. You, you have this life to, to really choose whatever path you want. The preacher wants us to understand that this one life is a precious gift, though, that should be enjoyed to the fullest. Uh, but in that enjoyment, in that pursuit, the only way it does not equal vanity is in the honoring of God in all we do. All right? So given that gift of free will, given that gift of life to be able to choose whatever path you want, to be whatever you want to be in this life, the fact is, though, the, the preacher brings that back around and saying, but many of those choices equal vanity. Many of those choices equal unhappiness or, or lack of joy and a life of of non-peace. But the fact is that when you serve God, when you give him back that free gift is where you find that joy. See, but that really is the key, right? Choosing to honor God, choosing daily to, to, for your life to be about Jesus' kingdom rather than your own, that's the key. Because looking at your life from a 30,000 foot perspective and asking yourself a few questions, you can start to realize where your kingdom truly lies, where your peace truly lies, where your joy truly lies. I, I try to ask myself these questions also, even in my own daily time with Jesus. Who do I honor in my daily pursuits and plans? Right? Who do I honor for, for, for the goals that I set? Who do I, who do I give glory to for the, the, even the little things in my life as I accomplish goals and I, and I kind of set out to, to you know, take care of tasks and take care of things of just life? Do I give glory to God or give glory to myself? Another question is, am I finding true joy in this life given to me? Am I always pursuing the next best thing? Am I always thinking about the next raise, maybe that other job, maybe the grass is greener on the other side? Or am I just enjoying the life God has given me right here and right now? Another question is, what is the purpose of this life, right, that I get to live? Right? <laughs> like, we've heard that question before. What's the purpose of life? Well, personally, I like to ask, like, what is the purpose of this one life God has given me? What, what is my job to do? And I hope and I pray that as we dig deeper into these several verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, that you would not only know the purpose, which is to honor God, which is to glorify him with your life as a created being, but the fact is that you would personally take on even the pursuit of joy, the pursuit of peace of a life lived to the full when that God is honored, when your Savior is praised and worshipped. So follow along with me, guys, as we pick up in verse 14 of Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'm excited. There is a vanity that makes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. I mean, if you look at what, what the preacher's saying here, he's giving us this, this kind of this contradiction or this, this uh, consideration, sorry, not contradiction, consideration of things that happen to righteous people are usually because the deeds of the, of the wicked. And things that happen to, to the wicked are usually because deeds of the righteous. And he's basically saying, like, how is this so? How do I understand this? So this also is vanity. Now this brings me to my first point from, from this teaching, which says, to find joy in this life, we must first find some acceptance of the things we cannot control. 
So in a sense, if we pursue this, this idea of joy, this idea of peace in serving Jesus, I think personally, and I think scripture teaches us, one of the first things, and I think most Christians kind of miss this, is that we have to come to a place of acceptance. Right? If you look at what the preacher says in verse 14, it, it really, it's like hard to grasp, it's hard to accept that like, wait, I don't have full control, that, that other people's actions affect me, that, that I, can't, I can't change them to, to better my situation. Like, how does that work? But see, I just want to bring that down and boil that down to the fact for you and I to find joy and peace under God, serving God, one of the first things we need to do is accept. Accept the fact that you and I are not in control. Now this kind of goes with the age-old question, why do good things happen to bad people and why do bad things happen to good people? But really the preacher actually takes it a step further by saying the righteous are affected because the deeds of the wicked and the wicked are affected because the deeds of the righteous. Neither the righteous or the wicked have say or control over what those effects are and how those affect their lives. Whether you're wicked, whether you're righteous, the fact is you don't get to say how those things affect you. You don't get to, in a sense, um, have control over the way those things impact your life all the time. Now, if we go back to the New Testament and look at Jesus, he explains it this way in Matthew 5, verse 44 through 46, where he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Now, looking at what the preacher says and then looking at Jesus' expansion of how a believer should perceive God's sovereignty and control, we come up with a few conclusions. Well, the first one is God is ultimately in control of the righteous and the wicked, and we need to accept that. Right, that God is ultimately in control. He's not just God of the righteous. He's not just God over, over the church or over the chosen people, as it were. He's over all humanity, the righteous and the wicked. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul talks about this a little bit where he says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each one will receive his, comm- his commendation from God. In 1 Corinthians, Paul lays it out like, listen, everything hidden, whether righteous or wicked, God knows. And he will judge those things. He, he sees those things, the most hidden parts of the church, the most hidden part of your life that you don't want anyone to know. Guess what? God knows about it. Right? And so the fact is that God is kind of the judge of all that. And so God is in control. He is over both the, the wicked and the, the righteous. The next one we conclude from the preacher and from Jesus is, our job as Christians is not to control the outcome of things, but to honor God in whatever outcome happens. So you and I can't always control what happens to us. We can't always control what people do to us, but we can control the, the outcome of, of how it, like in a sense, what, the way we react to that is what I'm trying to say. The way our, we react, our reaction, our, our outcome, in a sense, of, of the circumstance. Colossians verse 3, chapter 3, verse 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You mean thanks to God the Father through him. So when Paul wrote that in Colossians, he didn't say, Hey, if the circumstance is in a perfect place and you're comfortable with everything that's going on around you and nobody's offending you, then you honor God. No, Paul is saying, And whatever you do in word or deed, everything, honor God. So you can't always control the circumstances of, of what's happening around you, but you can control yourself. You can make the choices uh, to, to honor God in the midst of the most heinous circumstances. All right, another one we come up with is, despite what the wicked do, we as Christians must be like Jesus. Despite what a, a secular society, despite, despite what a wicked generation or a wicked government or a wicked ruler or a wicked whatever neighbor does, despite what they do, we need to be like Jesus. Again, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. As Jesus gave himself up, as Jesus, in a sense, (laughs) showed the love and the grace, the character of God to a wicked world, the call is still to us. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's happening in your life, You need to accept the fact that your call is to be like Jesus. Ultimately, the things we do have control over 
over our daily choices we make and the understanding that those choices affect ourselves and those around us in a big way. Now, the reason I say that is because we have to understand, we can't accept, we have to accept the fact that, that we don't have control, but we can change and we can, we can make the right choices in our own life and, and really accept the fact that the choices I do make, they matter, not just to myself, but to my wife, to my kids, to my ministry. Uh, an example I use with the youth just to show them the impact of the choices we make is I've been doing youth ministry, like I said, for some 15 years. I've been in five different churches doing youth ministry. I've spoken at camps for years, hundreds of kids. And because of today's technology, because of social media, many of those kids follow me on Instagram or, or you know, through, through, I don't do Snapchat, anyway, through Instagram <laughs> um, and just kind of through social media and things like that. So I'm still connected. Even 15 years ago, many of those kids are parents now and they serve within churches. Um, so think about this. If I made a choice to cheat on my wife, to, 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 to leave my wife and to have an affair on her, right? And word got out, I had to, I had to leave the pastoral position here at Calvary and, and I was disqualified from serving in ministry and the word got out to those hundreds of kids, those five different youth groups, kids that are now in a sense serving in churches, what would the impact be, the ripple effect of my one choice, of my, my one choice to, to, to leave my wife, to, to you know, walk away from my faith and the ministry. Like, what would the, be, the impact of that be? And the reason I say that is because it's true. Like, the choices we make, they matter. They mean something. Um, and so, kind of in that idea, the first step we need to take as we pursue this thing called joy and peace in Jesus is first accept the fact we're not in control, but that you and I can make the right choices each and every day. You and I have a choice of how we react to those circumstances each and every day. Now, stepping into the idea of joy, um, the preacher now says, and I commend joy in verse 15, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and to drink and to be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So now that we have looked through acceptance, we can look at truly what, what joy is, what, what, what we're supposed to have joy in. Which brings me to my second point, Christians should find sweet joy and pleasure in the life God has given them. Christians should find sweet joy and pleasure in the life that God has given them. One of the amazing gifts God has given us is the ability to trust him in the midst of the most crazy times and to find contentment and joy in him. So basically saying whatever's happening in the world around us, as Christians we have this beautiful gift that we can still find contentment and peace and joy just in Jesus. Not because of the circumstances, but just in Jesus. So we read other texts in the Bible, like Proverbs 18.10, that says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man or woman runs into him and is safe. Right? This idea that no matter what's happening around, we can run to Jesus and find safety there. Psalms 4 verse 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I mean, I love that line, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. You know, it's, it's like laying your head down on a pillow at the end of the day and having a clear conscience, being right with God, being right with people around you. The fact is that clear conscience helps you sleep. <laughs> being right with God helps you sleep. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This idea, this safety, this peace that comes with, with knowing that the God of the universe cares for me, that he knows me, he understands me. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus saying, my, my work, what I have for you, it's my yoke. It is easy. You'll find rest. It's not going to be the toil and the pull of the world. These verses and truths in Scripture should bring us such peace, such strength, and such joy as, as we look to the God that we serve. Now here's a side note as we, as we look deeper into this. This is in contrast, as the preacher says here, to eat and drink and to find joy. This is in contrast to the way the world looks at this, where the world says to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That is not what the preacher is saying. The preacher is not telling us to be a glutton of food and substance or to drink to the point of drunkenness and stupor. The preacher wants, us, wants to see us um, in a place of honoring and praising God as we enjoy the things that he created, as, he en as we enjoy the things that he laid out for us as created beings within this creation. 
And I would hope that as you listen to this teaching, you're, you're mature enough in your faith and you're wise enough in your faith that you know that like, this, God does not call us as Christians to a place of, of gluttony, a place of drunkenness, a place of, of taking advantage of the gifts and the things that God has given us. That should not be uh, named amongst us, as it were, as Christians. But we should be, be sober-minded. We should be Christians that can enjoy the gifts God has given us in this life without, in a sense, letting it be an addiction, letting it be a habit, become an idol within our life. Now, kind of thinking upon that, looking at joy, understanding that joy comes from honoring God, right? We can actually look at uh, this world and have this contrast between a secular world or a secular kingdom and a godly kingdom and actually look at some things that can actually kill joy, right? In a sense, these joy killers. Now, within God's kingdom, within Jesus' kingdom, these joy killers actually should bring us closer to Jesus, right? Actually bring us closer and and into a deeper faith. But these joy killers to someone outside of Jesus, outside of his kingdom, man, these things can just destroy them. These things can just put people in bondage and and just put weights on them and just make them come to a place of of just halting in in this life. So I really believe that there's three things, and the preacher talks about these three things, these three events that again, are, are these joy killers. The first one, and we kind of alluded to this, is sin and death. Sin and death, it's a huge joy killer. We have already alluded to, to the idea that death is, is something that we can't escape, but really the, the grip that, that sin has on this humanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3, the preacher says, This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the heart of the children of men are full of evil. And madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So the preacher just kind of describes this like in all humanity, he sees sin and death. Now again, within Jesus' kingdom, with with Jesus as our king and our our savior, something like sin and death, we understand, has been conquered. That he conquered it on the cross, that he, he, he destroyed death when he rose from the dead. But to someone outside of Jesus, how do they find joy? How do they find peace amidst something so ominous like sin and death? They can't. Now, uncertainty. Second joy killer, uncertainty. This, this bugs a lot of us. I know this bugs a lot of Christians. <laughs> what's the next choice? Where do I go? What's, the, what, what, what's, what's my plan in life? Just this uncertainty of what's going to happen. Now, outside of the understanding uh, that God has you and your faith is built on the rock that is Jesus, uncertainty can absolutely drown out your joy. If your faith is not built on the rock, which is Jesus, uncertainty will just drown out your joy. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, the preacher says, Again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle is to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor the riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those who have knowledge. But times and chance happen to them all. For men does not know his time, like fish that are taken up in an evil net, like a bird that is caught in a snare. So the children of men are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. See, it's kind of the idea that, that none of us, none of us know what's going to happen the rest of the day. None of us know what is really, is really before us, right? When we step out of the door and we drive to our jobs or we, we even drive to church or wherever, no one knows what's going to happen. When you get in a car wreck, you had no idea that was going to happen. I, I mean, I've been rear-ended a couple times. It's like the most surprising thing. You're just, you're in such shock. You're like, why did that happen? I mean, that's uncertainty. That's life, though. And just think, when you don't have that peace that God's got you in his hands, that your faith and, and you, are, you are steadfast in Jesus, if you didn't have that, think how, how just unsure you are and how uncertainty can just rock you. The last joy killer is injustice. Straight up injustice. Outside of the saving grace of Jesus, our joy dies in the face of injustice. Right, many of you have kids. <laughs> I do. And I hear the it's not fair line. They don't do it so much anymore because I think they're tired of me saying back to them, well, buddy, life's not fair because life isn't fair. And the preacher saw this. Ecclesiastes 9.2, he says, It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is he who shuns an oath. Basically, he's saying it doesn't matter where you stand on that line, whether righteous or wicked, whether in Jesus' kingdom or in the world's kingdom, injustices will happen. They will. We see it in our world all the time. But see, in Jesus, in that kingdom, 
The fact is, we have hope that there will be ultimate justice. But see, a world outside of Jesus doesn't have that ultimate justice. They don't have that hope. Tim Chaddock, uh, he's a preacher. He actually wrote a book called Better on the book of Ecclesiastes. And he wrote this. He said, if this is all there is, this is all there is, then what is the point of life? If we simply come from dust and end up as dust, what does it matter how we live in the meantime? What's the point of morality, uh, mo- morality, mortality, I'm sorry, what is the point of mortality if we live in a world devoid of ultimate justice? What's the point of this whole thing if there's never going to be any type of justice, if there's never going to be an ultimate justice? But brothers and sisters, there is ultimate f- justice found in Jesus' work of salvation on the cross. There ultimately is justice because of what Jesus did on that cross. He alone took on all the injustice, all the uncertainty, all the sin and death of this mortal world. Jesus showing us God's love, his grace, his patience, and his salvation gives us an eternal hope that does not only manifest an eternal life, but manifests itself through the church today, to the world that is destroyed by these these uncertainties, by these injustices, and it desperately needs to experience that pure joy that we have, that pure satisfaction, that pure steadfastness that we have in Jesus. See, we can experience that ultimate justice. We can experience a Savior that, that died on that cross for us. And you guys, let's praise the Lord for that. Let's praise him for that. Now, in conclusion, as we finish verses 16 and 17, guys, let's uh, read along with me. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on the earth, how neither day nor night uh, do one's eyes sl- see sleep, Then I saw all the work, verse 17, of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man uh, may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. So in conclusion, my last point is find joy in having the faith of a child and the heart of a seeker. If you look at verse 16 and 17, we can really kind of get a glimpse of, of not only what the preacher is viewing, but kind of his world view kind of what he surmises of man's toil, of man seeking after this higher knowledge or trying to understand what God is about. But I just want to encourage you, Christian, we should find joy in just having a faith like a child and just having a heart that seeks after God, even though we may not have all the answers. If we look at verses 16 and 17, we can surmise just this kind of current cultural climate that the preacher had. And the first one is he applied his heart to know wisdom and understanding, right? He actually did that. He said, I I looked for it. I wanted to know, uh, I wanted to understand what was happening in the world around me. He sees how many will work tirelessly night and day. He he observed the fact that man just left to their own will toil and toil and work and work. He says, no one slept neither night or day. They even, I mean, we think it's a modern day thing that we're working our fingers to the bone in 80 hour weeks, but man, I don't think it is. I think it's a human thing because our value, our worth is found in in what we do, right? How much have you produced? What are you making? And that is your worth, but that's not the way it is in God's kingdom. He also looks to God to find meaning and realizes God's, God orchestrates so much more than we could even ever hope to imagine. God orchestrates. When he says everything under the sun, he's basically saying everything on earth, everything that moves, the climate, the, the, the seasons, right? It's the animals, all that. God orchestrates every bit of that. He finally surmises man can never truly understand or know all that God does for us each and every day. He kind of surmises that, that man is going to seek, man is going to try to to understand what God is and even create their own ideologies and theologies and this type of humanism that, that kind of pushes God aside because we can explain and we can figure out how all this thing works, but the fact is we can't. We can't. The preacher just kind of lays this out. We can conclude from the preacher's observation that having the faith of a child keeps us trusting our Heavenly Father as a child trusts their daddy wholeheartedly. If you have kids, you know this. You would put them in the car seat and start driving and your kid just would be along for the ride. Maybe when they get a little older in their toddler stage, they go, hey, where are we going? Daddy, where are you taking me? And you could could say whatever you want. And they're going to be, okay, yeah, that's where we're going. They didn't care. They were just along for the ride. Remember the first time we took our kids to Disneyland, driving from Northern California down to Southern. It's it's an eight nine hour drive, and and you know I love that your kids are so gullible because basically they don't know where you're going, 
And so they keep asking, where are we going? Why is this taking so long? And our excuse was, oh, we're just, we're just uh, visiting the gas stations in California. So we'd be stopping at gas stations. They were just like, even at little toddlers, they're like, this is stupid. Why are we visiting gas stations? This doesn't make sense. But see, having that faith like, chi- like that ch- childlike faith, the fact is we can trust God wholeheartedly, just like our, your child trusts you. Um, also allowing ourselves to have the heart of a seeker, you guys, keeps us pr- pursuing God and all his wonder and all his purpose and all his plans for our life and the current culture he has placed us in. See, we don't live when Solomon lived in the preacher. We live now. We live in 2020. We live in, in this century during this time. We have a, a cultural climate around us. And so God has placed you and I in this time and in this place and having that heart of a seeker, continuing to pursue God, that, that in a sense, it informs us, it shows us, and it keeps us in that wonder and that purpose of what God has for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 32, it's describing, um, it's describing some of the sons of Jacob, and, and they get to the sons of Issachar, and, and when they describe the sons of Issachar, they say, men who understood the times and know what Israel, sh- Israel should do. I love that line, they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. And also the Apostle Paul to Timothy says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. As Paul encouraged Timothy to continue in the faith and push forward in Ephesus as a, pre- as a pastor, he said, God will give you understanding in everything. So looking at these, looking at these several verses, we see that, that as we come to a place of acceptance, as we come to a place of finding joy and peace within just where God has us, and then, and then ultimately, you guys, having this faith like a child and seeking God, we come to this place of, of really a steadfastness, almost like a holding fast to God when so much around us isn't, we're not able to hold fast to. See, as you daily pursue Jesus and learn from him as a faithful disciple, your joy will be deepened and not just be an emotion, but a foundational part of who you are. Your acceptance of things you you cannot control will become more apparent in your life. You'll be less anxious. You'll be less kind of manipulative, trying to figure out, trying to control everything because you're just trusting God with the things that you can't control. The contentment you find in God's plan for you will will show through your daily peace and um, and exhibit like exhibit to those around you. There will be a peace about you rather than just this this franticness because the fact is you have a contentment because you're trusting God. Your biblical world biblical worldview will become more a part of everything you are as you trust God with simple faith and seek after Him with a strong conviction. Right? It's it's less of riding the fence of like, where do I, where do I really believe in? Where do my convictions lie? Because as we, as you continue to seek after God, you have that faith like child and you, you, you seek him with your whole heart. The conviction grows stronger and you start your, that Christian will view really like penetrates and really kind of culminates everything that you are. Now, as we look to this, you guys, I, I would hope that, that you would continue to find this, this beautiful product of, of, of seeking after God within yourself that you would, you would see this in your life, that you would be encouraged that as you continue in this way and honoring God with, with all that you are. When we looked at that first verse where Jesus said you sum up the commandments with loving your God with all your heart, soul, mind, like this sums it all up. You could def- take that and define that in your own life. You'd build your faith on that foundation. And to help you along with that, I've got a couple application points as we finish out this sermon. My first application is daily ask the Lord to learn how to have acceptance of the things you cannot change. Daily ask the Lord to learn how to, how, learn to have acceptance of the things you cannot change. There are things in your life you just can't change. Maybe it's a situation, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a family member. <laughs> and the fact is you just can't change them. But see, you can ask the Lord to help you accept that person, help you accept the situation, help you accept what that person is doing um, and really then pursue them as Jesus would have you pursue them. Number two is daily find peace in the time and place God has you in today. Daily find peace in the time, God, time and place God has you in today. I mean, that's just basically looking at your life and knowing that God has you here for a reason. Maybe you're upset. Maybe, maybe COVID has, has put you in a place where you don't want to be. Maybe you're just kind of frustrated because of your situation with your job or your marriage. But see, you need to understand you're in this place for a reason. You're there for a reason, and God has you there for that reason. 
And to really find peace in that, you got to pray. you got to seek the Lord for that. Number three is ask the Lord for the simple faith of trusting him in your daily lives. Find the simple places you can have faith. Find the simple places, the simple ways that you can just have faith in the Lord. And the last one, you guys, is seek the Lord with conviction and put Jesus at the top of your priority list. I know in this day and age, there's easy, it's so easy to have things at the top of your priority list. Wearing masks, right? Maybe wearing masks at the top of your priority list. Man, I don't like wearing masks or I, I love wearing masks and that's the, my top of my priority list. In all honesty, wearing masks is just a thing. That should be down here in your priority list. Jesus should be at the top of your priority list. So I just ask you to, to maybe pray. Pray and ask the Lord, like, Jesus, where are you on my priority list? What number are you? Are you number 25 or are you number one? I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, put them at number one. So guys, I hope this encourages you. If you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, do a study in it. It's encouraging. It gives you a different perspective. Father, I come before you right now. I ask and pray that your word would just be true and real in the hearts and minds who ever hear, heard this message. God, convict and Lord, draw people closer to you through it. In your name we pray, amen.